Okay, hello and welcome to the next in our series of webinars at WCT School London. Uh, welcome to those of you that haven't joined us before. Welcome back to those of you that have. Uh, my name is Julia Lambeth. I'm purely here as moderator uh, for this evening. Uh, your host today, who's going to take you through um, all of his wonderful information about Bergerac, is Richard Lane. Uh, Richard, you may have seen on our webinars before. He is um, a wine fan, uh, hasn't generally worked in the wine trade, uh, has got a background in uh, medical journalism, um, but I think we can say a pretty serious fan as uh, he has literally in the last week found out that he's completed his diploma. Um, so round of applause at home, if you will. Um, but I will leave that there from me for now. I'll let Richard tell you a little bit more about himself um, and the region as a whole. So over to you, Richard. Thank you very much, Julia, and um, good, e good evening, everyone. Uh, can't see you because uh, I'm blind, not, but your cameras aren't on anyway. I can't hear you, which is, which is great, I, but I get the impression quite a few of you are out there. And it sounds like you're quite an international audience, so that is really fantastic. So thank you ever so much for, for, for joining this webinar. Yeah, this webinar is called Discover Bergerac because um, two or three years ago, my wife Liz and I decided, frankly, we needed a year off <laughs> in middle age uh, because they didn't have uh, years off when uh, we sort of were, were younger. So uh, we decided to have a year in France if we both lived the uh, uh, loved the country, but had never lived there, spoke a bit of French, that sort of thing. The wine connection is actually quite interesting because um, I only started studying wine seriously back in 2016 at WSET London when I joined and did level two, um, which was then called level two wines and spirits. Uh, it's now level two wines uh, Bur at uh, the London Centre in Bermondsey. And that got my taste going clearly for wine and getting some education going. And then the following year, I thought, well, why don't I try level three? Because much as I'd love the level two, I wanted to know a bit more which is a bit of a habit of mine, wanting to know more. <laughs> anyway, so, I, and I know we've got lots of WACT level three students on the call tonight, so that's great. And rather jammily on my, for me, in my level three theory exam, which was four years ago, exactly four years ago, um, Bergerac came up on the paper, which was quite fortuitous because it was just at that time that Liz and I were deciding to have our year off and we thought that Bergerac might be a good region to go to because we wanted to go far enough south that the climate, so we thought, would be much warmer and drier than uh, good old blighty uh, England. And also, so, uh, you know, slightly selfishly, although Liz liked wine too, could, uh, could develop the wine um, research, shall we say, around Bergerac, so, um, so that was rather nice. Uh, so we, we, we had this year off um, starting in the autumn of 17, going through to the late summer of 18, so just about a year, uh, three years ago, and, and, and Bergerac was, was briefly our home, and uh, it was a really, really wonderful year. Um, but in terms of the, the wines of Bergerac, we knew, although it came up in my exam, so I knew a bit, of, knew a bit about it, it was a real discovery, not just discovering the region, because uh, the region around Bergerac, which is which the department is called the Dordogne, uh, historically it's called the Perigord, is a really interesting historic area. It's also, from the wine point of view, quite interesting because it's so close to Bordeaux. Uh, Bordeaux, as the crow flies from, from Bergerac, uh, is 84 kilometres, about 50 miles, but it feels a lot further than that when you're out there, because life in, in uh, Bergerac, the Dordogne, Stroke Perigord is quite slow, very rural, very rustic. So the whole wine scene discovery was interesting. And I like to start my wine webinars, as some of you may have noticed, with a quote. Last time when I did a talk back in December on Longadoc, it was Oz Clark. I'm actually going to uh, quote from, from Jancis, Jancis Robinson, no less, probably you know, the most famous wine critic in the world for, for many, many years. And she says in the Oxford Companion to Wine, it has long been difficult for the wines of Bergerac to escape from the shadow of Bordeaux's more serious wine reputation. 
But thanks to much more sophisticated use of oak and pioneering producers such as Luc de Conti and David Fortou and some sweet winemakers, some truly fine wine is being made. And I think terrific because for a lot of people, people have heard of Bergerac, they've heard of Cyrano de Bergerac, <laughs> the, the, the play in the film, uh, Gerard Depardieu, do you remember in the, in the film? And, and if you're my age, or older and living in the UK, you may remember a certain detective from the Channel Islands, but I'm not going to talk about him, I promise. But Bergerac, um, often it's, it's people have heard of it, but they're not quite sure what it is. So that's what this evening is all about. Okay, let's, as usual, go to the maps. We've got a couple of, well, a few maps to look at. Let's look at the next slide, please, Julia. The first map, this is, hopefully you recognize this rather large, lovely country called France. Uh, with a few colours going on there. I won't go through them all. That uh, nice though it would be to start off in Champagne in the northeast. If you could take your eyes down to Bordeaux, which is um, sky blue colour, three quarters of the way down, about one third of the way in from the left. Okay. There is Bordeaux. And immediately to the right, to the east of Bordeaux, you can hopefully see two green rectangles separated by a bit of space. The first green rectangle immediately next to Bordeaux, that is Bergerac, okay? Then there's a bit of a gap, and then just east, it's actually very slightly southeast of there, is Cahors. Um, Cahors, of course, the spiritual home of Malbec. Um, we're not going to talk about Cahors tonight, though Malbec does get a couple of mentions, okay? And then looking at the... Let's go to the next map, actually. I think it's more interesting uh, in terms of placing Bergerac, Julia. So this is a slightly closer look at... Um, southwest France. Also, it's really important to say to, to understand that southwest France is southwest France. <laughs> it's not the south of France, okay? Really, really important because um, if you say if you say to someone you're going down to Biarritz or Bordeaux, they think, oh, you're off to the south of France. No, you're not. The south of France is the Midi. It's it's uh, it's the Mediterranean. This is the Atlantic influence southwest of France. It's a very very large area. Historically, it's called Aquitaine famous in the Middle Ages from uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine, of course, and she married a guy called Henry who became King of England, and that meant the whole of this area was under English rule 300 years. I think this is partly why the English love it so much, and so many of them live there, particularly in Bergerac, where you can struggle to practice your French sometimes because there are so many Brits around. But looking at this map, again, just to orientate ourselves, you've got the Gironde, top left, so that's famous uh, obviously for, for Bord some of Bordeaux's finest chateau top left. That blue line is the Dordogne River, which connects Bordeaux with the Bergerac region. Uh, Bergerac you can see is a sort of turquoise color there, turquoise color. And then that area, red, slightly east, southeast again on the previous map, that, there's Cowra again, you see it's red on this map. That large encircled area below, further south, um, big oval area, that's the Côte de Gascogne. So that's a big area of high volume, terrifically refreshing, inexpensive white wine that's um, uh, particular to the southwest, particularly the great variety Colomba with a bit of Sauvignon Blanc. And you can see a couple of little colours to the kind of southwest of that oval block. You've got, in a fawn colour, you've got Madiron, okay, famous for its highly tannic, really chewy red wines that need a lot of ageing. And then just beyond that, in the grey colour, you've got Jurançon. You're right down here in the Pyrenees, almost in Spain, a long way from Bergerac, I have to say, probably 300 kilometres south. Um, and Jurançon, famous, of course, for some fabulous sweet wines and some dry whites as well. The reason I mention this is because southwest France is also the name of, of a wine region called, imaginatively, southwest France. Because if you're not Bordeaux, Okay, Bordeaux is Bordeaux and everyone's heard of Bordeaux. If you're doing wine in Southwest France and you're not Bordeaux, you're just put into this great big category called Southwest France, which is vaguely helpful, but not terribly helpful because there's so much diversity. You've got a lot of distance involved, as I've just said. You've got many different appellations, many different sort of historic cultural things going on, indigenous grape varieties. You know, Bergerac to Jurançon down by the Pyrenees, you, you know, we might as well be talking Bergerac to the Loire Valley or Bergerac going over towards the Rhone Valley. It's not that helpful, but it is all part of this great historic 
cultural part of southwest France called Aquitaine, or Aquitaine, or Aquitaine as they call it in France. Let's go to the next slide and look at another map, <laughs> but uh, more colours. But this is more uh, of a tourist information map because you can't talk about uh, the Perigord without talking about a bit about what the Perigord or the Dordogne area is like. And wine is definitely at the heart of the cultural activity uh, of this region, unquestionably, but it's not the only thing that's going on. Let's just look at these colours. Some bright spark in the Dordogne um, Office of Tourism apparently created this about 30 years ago to try and um, you know, a bit of marketing pull into the, into the region. Um, so you've got these different colours. You've got the black, the, the Perigord Noir, the black Perigord, that's generally over to the east. That's where you get lots of dark forest. And it is dark over there, as Liz, my wife, will confirm. It's all very bunched together. Lots of uh, oak forests, got lots of walnut trees. Um, it's truffle territory as well, as it is further north in, in the Perigord Vert. So you've got a lot, lot of uh, interesting, uh, the walnuts in this area are fantastic. You can even get a wine made from walnuts, uh, with walnuts rather, it's called a Van de Noir. it's delicious. At the white area in the middle, that's really to do with the, the chalk soils in the middle and uh, that's sort of north of Bergerac. You can see that Bergerac, the town, is at the sort of, uh, I, you can see, Fairly, I think Julia's highlighting it now, fairly much in the centre there uh, of, the, of the purple area. And it's called the, the Perigord pur Purple or the Perigord Purpura because of the wine, the colour of the vine leaf. The vine leaf can not always turn purple in the autumn, which is rather lovely. And then further north, you've got the Perigord Vert, the green area. This is rolling pasture land, lots of cows, lots of uh, that sort of farmyard activity, not wine territory. So this is a region of, of contrasts. The region itself is about, I suppose this whole area is about the size of Wales, something like that. So it's fairly large, but not quite as big as Wales. Sorry, you know, I know we've got some Welsh people listening, um, but you know, getting on for that sort of size. So, as I said, it's the, it's the department is called the Dordogne. Historically, it's called the Perigord. What is it like? Well, it's it's definitely rural and rustic, okay? <clears throat> if you're wanting city lights, uh, like Bordeaux, for example, <laughs> forget it. I mean, you can get the train to Bordeaux, but it's a very, very slow wobbly train down, down to Bordeaux. This is all about the countryside. This is about rural people. This is about an area where there are prehistoric cave paintings that go back four or 5,000 years. The walnuts and truffles I've already mentioned. Duck and geese, the local, a gastronomy is dominated. It's not great for vegetarians. I have to warn anyone who's thinking of going on holiday when we can start traveling again. Uh, it's very much based around a rich diet of duck and goose particularly with these lovely nuts and of course the truffles. Foie gras, the dreaded foie gras. I'm not a fan I have to say but it does pair very well with the sweet Montbazillac wine. The very first day, full day that Liz and I were in our local town of Beaumont du Perigord southeast of Bergerac, you go to, we went to the market, of course, the first thing you do is go to the market to see what's happening. And someone immediately put a great big giant skewer in my hand. And, uh, and of course, I immediately started nibbling the end of it without even thinking what it was. And it was the dreaded, in my terms, foie gras. But I think in, in the Perigord, to say you're vegetarian is sort of okay. To say you're not vegetarian and you don't like foie gras, they give you a funny look by all accounts. But there you go. Also, historically in this land, it used to be not just wine and agriculture, it used to be tobacco. Tobacco leaves grown everywhere. So you could say that the Perigal was the center of wine and, and tobacco smoking and rich food, not terribly healthy. And yet, there have been a few studies not published in the Lancet, the journal I've done a lot of work for over, over many years, I have to admit. There have been a few observational studies suggesting that people in the Perigord live to a great age. And Liz and I met a lot of very old people. And you hear stories of people living to a hundred, just over a hundred, the locals. I don't know what it is. The duck fat, the red wine, the tobacco, or maybe the relaxed pace of life. Who knows? But there is, happily, if you don't like foie gras, and, uh, and duck and, and goose and all the rest of it, <clears throat> there is some very nice wine. At least you can wash it down. And I certainly, when I have occasionally had foie gras, I quickly wash it down with some very nice wine. Let's look at the map, but from a wine perspective. Next slide, please, Julia. And um, the area, 
I love this name. Generally, the wine area is called Le Bergeracois. Le Bergeracois is the wine region, okay? Um, we're going to re revisit this map a couple of times in the presentation, so I'm not asking you to memorize all these colors and names now, okay? But just to say, I think one of Bergerac's difficulties, apart from the fact that it adjoins Bordeaux, the great big brother next door that gets all the attention, is that Bergerac is actually slightly confusing as a wine region. For a small, I mean, small to kind of medium size, we're talking production of half a million litres a year, 0.5 million hectolitres a year from around 10,000 hectares. It's around the 10th, maybe 8%, 10% the size of Bordeaux. It's, it's okay, Bordeaux is enormous, clearly. Bergerac's not tiny, but it's not, it's sort of only just bordering on medium size, small to medium size. For, for, for a wine territory like this, it's potentially a bit confusing. There are 13, one, three appellations if you apply them all to the different colors of wine that are produced, and we're going to talk about them. But happily, there is great diversity in Bergerac. Much as I love Malbec and Caol, which is only 50 miles down the road from southeast of, of Bergerac, if you go for a visit in, uh, in Caol or you go to the Maison du Vin, you just end up tasting a load of lovely of Malbec wines and they're great, but there isn't a huge amount of variety just within, within, that, just within Malbec. In Bergerac, you can be sipping a really lovely, crisp uh, Bergerac Blanc Sec, dry white wine. You could be having a medium sweet wine. You could be having a lusciously sweet wine, and we're going to look at Montbaziac a bit later on. You could be having a lovely rosé, but it's not going to be a pale pink rosé that, that looks like it's come from Provence. Oh, no, no, no. This is the Perigord. There's no pale pink rosé going on around here. Well, there certainly weren't, wasn't much when Liz and I were going there. I don't know if they've got any more going on at the moment. A great amount of diversity. Um, okay, so just to give you an idea from this map as to some, what some of those appellations might be, we're not going to cover all of them. Generally, the Bergerac appellation, and by the way, most of the area is under appellation, okay? There are 13 appellations here. So the, most of the wine, if you visit the area that you will taste, will be within the Appalachian system. Having said that, the very first wine that Liz and I sipped, having had the skewer of foie gras from the market, was a Van de Perigord, and it was a Sauvignon um, Blanc, um, uh, just under a, a lesser, if you like. It's, it's a step back from the main Appalachian. It's called the IGP system. It just means that winemakers can make wine more freely with, with fewer rules, and they do have this IGP thing called Van de Perigord, uh, and um, you know you don't see that much of it, but the one that we have quite often from our local shop is very, very nice. But most of the wines are within the Appalachian system. So the, the red zone you see on this map is generally the stuff that comes under the Bergerac, the main Bergerac Appalachian, which can be a white or red ap uh, Appalachian. Montbaziac, which you can see to the south of Bergerac, is south of the River Dordogne. That's a sort of, um, that's sort of orange zone there. We'll talk about that later. Um, there's an area we haven't got time to focus on this evening called Péchamont, which is kind of just to the east of Bergerac, north of the river, that make quite structured red wines, particularly because of the uh, kind of iron layer they've got in the soil there called Tran, which is quite interesting. And later on we'll pop over to the wild west of Mont Ravel, that's an area that I hope you're looking at is sort of olive green over, over to the west. And a little tiny area called Rosette, where they make medium sweet uh, wines. Uh, I think you get the impression that you know, medium sweet, who drinks medium sweet wines? Well, they do a little bit in Bergerac. Bergerac is not fashionable. Bergerac wine has probably not been fashionable since about 1750, when uh, the Dutch very kindly drained the marshy Medoc to the west of Bordeaux, which created all the fabulous chateau that gets all, gets all the headlines today. Okay, let's move on because we need to visit the Maison du Vin, and I must apologize because actually this one in Bergerac is called the Maison des Vins because it covers two appellations, Bergerac and a very small app appellation called Dura, which is down near the entre deux mer white wine region to the east of Bordeaux. But anyway, the Maison du Vin. But word of advice for, for anyone, if you're ever visiting France or any, any wine region of the world, particularly to get your bearings, or if you're visiting a town that's in a wine region and you don't have time to go and visit the vineyards, go to the Maison du Vin. 
talk to the person behind the bar, they'll give you a tasting, they'll hopefully explain the whole area to you. And this lady, Francoise, got a bit sick of the sight of me, I think, as I kept going there with Liz and various um, visitors who came out to, to see us during our year out there. But it's a great way of getting to know the region. And the nice thing about the Maison uh, des Vins et Dura in uh, Bergerac is it's actually, the building is beautiful. It's, an 11th, it's set in an 11th century cloister um, in the old town of Bergerac, just very close to the river Dordogne, because Bergerac, as you saw from the map, is, is right on the river Dordogne. And that's rather appropriate, really, because whilst undoubtedly the Romans got the whole wine scene moving uh, in these parts around 2000 years ago, it was really the monks and the monasteries of medieval time. As I mentioned in the Longadoc presentation, if you saw that one that I did back in, um, in December, that made wine a really important commodity in terms of you know, the cultural landscape. And so that was, you know, obviously France being a Catholic country, monks and monasteries um, very prominent in the area. Um, and still are in some ways, of course. And then as time moved on, and you got sort of more towards the Renaissance period, sort of 15th, 16th century. This is when the trade became started becoming important because in around sort of 16th century, even early 15th, 16th, 17th century, the as I, as I mentioned, because of what had gone on before, the English, sorry, before the English lost the territories in southwest France, which is when they lost the Hundred Years' War by famously um, taking their, uh, their troops in, into getting wet in the River Dordogne and losing the Hundred Years' War. This was English territory for 300 years, and that had created an export trade, which meant that wines from Bergerac would, would be put in barrels on flat little boats called gabas that are kind of low lying and very flat, and they would have rocked on down the river down to places like Libourne and Bordeaux, and then it would have been shipped to England because back here in England, the wines of Bergerac were, were very much liked by, by the aristocracy. So that had created an export route because of the English territories in this region going way back when. Then after the English had to hand back the land <laughs> to the French, it was there to begin with, let's face it, um, the Dutch actually um, got involved because they liked this region very much and they developed particularly interest in developing and making sweet wines. And said, so we'll, we'll visit Montbaziac in, in a bit. And as, as I've already mentioned, it was, it was the Dutch that drained the Medoc left of uh, to the left bank of Bordeaux from being a malarial swamp in around the late 17th century. And when that happened, the Dutch unwittingly were kissing goodbye actually to Bergerac as being uh, a, a wine region of great prominence because that meant Bordeaux could build its huge reputation with the likes of Lafitte and all the rest of it, with all those great vineyards that came through the 18th century, 19th century. And as a result of that, Bordeaux became big and illustrious and Bergerac became a backwater. Okay, what else in terms of a quick history of, of Bergerac? Well, like all of the whole world, with a couple of exceptions, um, Bergerac uh, obviously had to deal with the phylloxera crisis. What's that? Some of you are thinking, what's he on about? Just but very briefly, this was a little aphid-like bug that decimated worldwide vineyards with a couple of exceptions like Chile and South Australia. But the rest of the wine world, basically the vines were all destroyed by this horrible little bug and um, vines had to be replanted massively in the early 20th century. Then in 1936, an important year, because this was the year in which the Appalachian system really got going, well, did get going in France. So up until 1936, Bergerac was part of the Bordeaux wine region. It wasn't part of what I said earlier about being southwest France. Bergerac was connected to Bordeaux. Okay, it had become a very poor relation to Bordeaux, but it was still connected. But come 1936, Appalachian Controle, the Bordeaux wine region, uh, Appalachian created, uh, uh, Bergerac not part of it, Bergerac, Appalachian created, all those other Appalachians, Chateauneuf du Pape was the first one, wasn't it, um, down in the, in the Southern Rhone. All the other ones, you know, I mean, obviously a lot of them have come later on, but the first Appalachian Controle areas of, of uh, wine for France, 1936, okay. Right, that's enough of history and bearings. Let's talk a little bit about climate. And I'm starting off with the, perhaps the, the nicer side of the climate that we experience um, in Bergerac. I, 
But seriously, okay, and it's a jokey picture, and golly, it can get very, very hot. But the point I'm, I want to make here is that it really is a classic case, and particularly for those of you who are uh, students this evening, Bordeaux clearly is a maritime climate because of the influence of the Atlantic. Bergerac, interestingly, still, <laughs> still has a massive, I think, maritime influence because it rains like heck a lot of the time. And there's, there are no mountains or hills to protect Bergerac from the Atlantic Ocean. So when those storms and the rain comes in from the Atlantic, okay, it gets to Bordeaux first before it gets to Bergerac, but it still gets here to, to Bergerac too. But it's very much the point in this hot uh, picture you're seeing, and I think you can see Topper there very sensibly taking shade. So, so it's a, a mad Englishman and not so much a mad dog. Um, the heat can be very intense because when you're this far inland, despite what I said about getting the rain from the Atlantic, there is definitely a continental influence here. It's not a continental climate. It's a maritime meeting um, a slightly continental climate. Okay. Um, and it means that when, the, and the, Liz and I used to call the weather generous or capricious, it's certainly capricious, and again, going back to what I said earlier, you think you're in the south of France? No, you're in southwest France. That means it can rain and it can rain during the growing season. It can rain, rain during harvest. So you can have a lot of variability here. But when you get hot spells here, wow, can it get hot. And the past two or three summers, they've had heat spikes. They've had periods during the summer where they've had spells of, of temperatures 40 degrees and above for quite a long time. So it can be very, very hot. But also, because of the con slight continentality you get with the climate, you do get this big difference between daytime and nighttime temperatures. And it's the thing we've really noticed coming from England, where generally our nighttime, daytime difference may be maybe seven degrees or five degrees or seven degrees. Uh, there in, in the Bergerac, it can be in the summer, it can be 20 degrees. Why is that important? When I say 20 degrees, it might be 35 degrees on a hot summer's day, going down to 15 at night. That is important from the winemaker's point of view because you can hang on to the acidity in the grapes, which is really, really important, okay? Same as I mentioned when we talked about the Languedoc. Okay, uh, next slide, uh, please, Julia, <laughs> is the opposite, opposite of this. And uh, gosh, can it get cold in uh, inland France, even when you're three quarters of the way down France as we were there. And again, because I mentioned this slight touch of continentality in the climate, it can be a real headache for, 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 for winemakers, for, for viticulture. Um, the year that Liz and I and Topper went out there to live, uh, 2017, we went out for a recce to, to check out the place we were going to live in. We went a few months earlier, we went out in Easter time, mid to late April, 2017. And I'm sure many of you May, may know this, that 2017 um, was, a com was a bit of a disaster for, for European wine generally, not just in France, because of an absolutely paralyzing late spring frost that happened that year. We were there at the time, it was the day we flew back. And I remember we went into Bergerac town to do a bit of shopping before we went to the airport. I thought we'd landed, we'd turned up in, on the South Pole. It was so cold. Uh, we were like it is now almost, you know, we were having a cold sp spell at the moment. 27th of April, so you're almost in May, okay. The bud break, you know, the, the, the buds have formed their shoots probably in March, early to mid-March. So, you know, your flower is already out in the garden and then you're almost in May and then you get minus seven degrees frost at the end of April. Absolute catastrophe, as they would say out there. And some producers, um, actually lost a whole vintage because of it. If their aspect, if that you know, the, if the way their vines were facing, if they were facing north or they weren't protected by forests and trees and other things like that, it could have been an absolute, well, it was an absolute disaster. Okay, and on the next slide, please, as I've already alluded to probably a bit too much already, it does rain a lot. <laughs> When everyone, anyone, anyone says Atlantic influence to me, I just, just think puddles. And the spring, particularly in the Perigord, can be very, very wet. It's very wet there at the moment. Uh, our friends, uh, we've got met, met obviously quite a few friends 
while we were there. And whilst it's snowing and freezing cold here, down there at the moment, it's just soggy. And um, one good thing, I suppose, in terms of from viticulture point of view is that if you're going to get a really hot summer with that intense heat that I've mentioned, you can get at least the water table is pretty high. So hopefully the vines won't get too stressed if it's been a, a wet spring. And of course, wet also means fungal disease, mold and all these ghastly things that you don't want from a viticultural perspective. And therefore that means that worthy, but, but practices such as organic or biodynamic viticulture can be really challenging because obviously it can rain. You're in southwest France. It can rain at any time. OK, let's move on to the next slide. Let's have a quick look at soils and terroir. Just very quickly, this lovely guy has got a wonderful name, Xavier uh, de Saint-Exupéry. The Saint-Exupéry family are famous. It's the name of the airport in Lyon. And uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, he was the aviator killed in World War II who wrote Le Petit Prince, which is a book that everyone in France, every child in France reads from about the age of 10, you know, philosophical and all the rest of it. Anyway, this guy, Xavier, is a distant relation of... Uh, of Antoine, and he owns one of the uh, private chateaux in Bergerac called uh, Chateau de Tirgonde near Bergerac. And um, he gave me a terrific hands-on experience of soil and terroir. So for myself, uh, not seeing, that was really invaluable. And um, when we're talking soil, generally, <laughs> as I found everywhere I went in France, not just Bergerac or Bordeaux or Burgundy, it's all about the clay limestone balance seems to be the big matter that, that they're concerned about. Argile, clay, calcare, limestone. And a lot of the top producers really, really prize the limestone, particularly. They think that has a really important terroir influence on, 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 on the viticulture um, because it's slightly alkaline. It keeps the acidity going in the grapes, which I've already mentioned is really important. You get a bit of flint sometimes as well. They call it silex. And because of the river influence, the Dordogne, you do get some alluvial sandy soils as well, which means you can get some lighter soils, which can lead to more sort of lighter, more perfumed wines. Whereas where you've got a dominance of clay, clay is quite thick and sticky, as you know, <laughs> you go walking on a clay soil, it's very muddy, that you get a lot of water retention there. And the water and nutrients means that the wines are often quite structured, quite powerful. Whereas the kind of lighter, more fragrant wines are often from a soil, uh, soils that are, are slightly lighter, sandier, alluvial, which you get more towards the west in Mont Ravel, which we'll take a quick look at in a minute. Uh, next slide, please, Julia. Here's the beautiful river, La Riviere, uh, the, um, the Dordogne, a uh, big old river. As I said, it starts off its life way up in the Auvergne in central France, winds its way down. It's a big, wide river, golly. It's about 400 kilometers long and it ends up uh, meeting the river Garon uh, just near Bordeaux to form the Gironde estuary, that massive estuary uh, that then flows out into the Atlantic. Okay, and of course the river is important historically not just for transporting the wine before we had trains and cars and all the rest of it, but obviously um, a terroir influence as well as I've mentioned alluvial sandy soils and also to, uh, in helping noble rot which we'll come to in a minute. Okay, and next slide please Julia, let's uh, a quick look again. This is a, a classic winter vine scene, this is what you'd probably see at the moment. Um, winter vine, so the, the vine is dormant and actually what's really important with viticulture at this time of year, January, February, is that the in, in the vineyard you've got, to, you've got to do your pruning and particularly under appellation rules where you'll have limits as to how much wine you can produce, the idea being that with lower yields, you're getting better quality wine because you're getting better fruit concentration. That means you've got to sit on your bum in the vineyard with your calculator and work out how many buds you want on these lats, these bits you can see on, on the vines. Because these lats, left and right, it's called guillot, uh, is, is the, the replacement cane pruning system. They contain buds and it's those buds that will form shoots in March, April, and it's those shoots that will produce the fruit. And it's therefore, you've got to work out how much wine you are able or want to produce within the Appalachian rules to give you the wine that you want. So pruning is really important at this time of year. Okay. 
by the way, usually there are about eight buds per each side on these lats, uh, on these uh, double geo um, winter vines that you're looking at, okay? And in terms of, um, sorry, just before we move on, just in terms of yields, won't bang on about it because it's a bit geeky, but basically Bergerac um, limit is 55 hectolitres per hectare. I'll explain it in a sec. And the Côte de Bergerac, which is slightly better quality, uh, wines 50 hectolitres per hectare. When you get to Montbaziac, a special sweet wine, just 30, okay. But taking Bergerac, 50 hectolitres, hectolitre is 100. So 50 hundreds, that's 5,000 litres per hectare, okay, of wine, just to give you an idea. Or if you want to imagine loads of bottles <laughs> sitting, a, sitting in a hectare of a vineyard, it's about 7,000 bottles, something like that. Let's move on, Julia. Um, just on this next slide, again, I just want to highlight because of the damp climate, green growth. Um, so again, controlling that green growth is really important. Um, particularly making sure you haven't got too much shading of your fruit once the fruit comes out in the summer. Uh, and also having cover crops, uh, not only is it good for, you know, uh, the microenvironment and encouraging you know, other life other than the vine, it's also good to have some competition for the plentiful water supplies that are delivered by the Atlantic influence. So um, you don't, vines don't want too much water. They want a bit, but they don't want too much. So you've got to encourage other things to come and take the water. Next slide, please. So when it comes to the red wines of Bergerac, which make up 50%, half the wine, wines are red. Um, Merlot is the dominant variety uh, that we're getting here, um, similar to the right bank of Bordeaux. So no big surprise there, given that the right part of Bordeaux is so close by. Cabernet Sauvignon, you do find it can ripen. You need obviously good ripening conditions. It's late ripening Cabernet, but because it's like can be slightly warmer in Bergerac, sometimes um, speak to producers, they can ripen Cabernet sometimes in some years where parts of Bordeaux might struggle. Tiny bit of Cabernet Franc, but less for Cabernet Franc than you get in uh, the right bank of Bordeaux. But you do get more Malbec here. Um, Malbec uh, with the spiritual home of Cowell down the road uh, is more, there's more Malbec here than there is in, Berger, uh, in Bordeaux. You do, uh, rosé wines make up about 10% made from black grapes and the method they use here is um, short maceration so the skins are in contact with the juice uh, okay which is where the colour comes from to create these rosé wines. It's not the delicate direct press uh, that gives you those ever so pale pink ones from um, Provence. I must stop going on about them. You get a, you get a quite a deep pink here. Not very, very deep pink, but it's very fruity pink. Uh, using Cabernet Sauvignon for the rosé, interestingly. Okay. And then moving on to the next slide with the green grapes and the white varieties. Again, lots of variety here. The classic one is the Bergerac Blanc Sec, and that will be made out of mainly Sauvignon Blanc, okay, and Semillon. And, in, and also Muscadel. Um, Semillon, uh, Semillon Sauvignon uh, is well known. Obviously, you get that here with Bordeaux Sauvignon and other, other Sauvignon, Semillon styles elsewhere. The Muscadel is more, uh, is more widely used in Bergerac than Bordeaux. And it's a wonderful grape. It's very fragrant. It's very oily. It adds great weight, mouth weight to the wine. Gives it a slightly exotic feeling in the mouth and texture. And, uh, and white wines make up about 40, yeah, 40% 40 of, of Bergerac's output. Okay, back to the map. So as I said, the whole region, and the numbers do vary. Every time I look up the numbers, they change everywhere I look. Um, but around 10 to 12,000 hectares, as I said, half a million litres, 0.5 million hectolitres, okay, which is about 1% of France's output, okay. 15% of Bergerac's wine is Montbaziac, which will be, which is the famous wine region of Bergerac that we're going to. I keep saying that. We are going there. Um, and in terms of producers, and uh, gosh, it's hard to find this out too, but literally I've had an email this afternoon from the Antiprofession Professionnel de Vin de Bergerac. Um, there are amazingly around 850 producers in the Bergerac region. They are not all private chateaux with their own vineyards, doing their own vinification, bottling and making their own wine 
on the property. You've got about 300 independent producers doing that, but you'll have around 500 producers producing grapes. Okay, that's what they want to do. <clears throat> Possibly selling them to a cooperative or doing the, or, and or making the, doing, sorry, be clear, they'll be making the wine in a carved cooperative. So they, they can produce the grapes, but they don't have the, the equipment or the expertise to make the wine okay. Whereas that applies to about 500 producers, whereas you've got about 300 who can do the whole lot. Okay, they're, they're called independents, okay. So uh, you do have cooperatives and the most famous cooperative as we'll see uh, is in Mombasia. Okay, next slide please, Julia. Gloire de Mon Père, another famous French book by Marcel Pagnol, but it's also a lovely wine uh, made by one of Bergerac's top producers called Luc de Conti at Chateau Tour de Gendre. Really happy to say that this is available in the UK because one of the biggest challenges people have with Bergerac wine is finding it and drinking it unless they're in the region because Bergerac's only exporting around 10% of its wines. Okay. And let's move on to that, that Gloire de Montpère. So that's a Côte de Bergerac and it's equal proportions of Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon and Malbec. Next slide, Julia. Here's the guy who makes it. Luc de Conti. De Conti? Sounds a bit Italian. Yeah, well, he, his family come from the Veneto in Northern Italy, but they've been in Bergerac for three or four generations. He's one of four or five really leading winemakers that have kind of put Bergerac on the map in the past 30 years or so. He's organic and he's got some plots that are biodynamic as well. And just one quick thing, and Julius put the link up to the previous one, the Gloire de Montpère in the chat. Last week, I had the pleasure of tasting one of Luc de Conti's white wines called the Moulin des Dames 2018, 100% Sauvignon Blanc. I'm sure many of you out there like your Sauvignon Blanc. This Sauvignon Blanc, 100% full-bodied, 14.5% alcohol, unctuous, grapefruit, apricot, mango, and with a hint of oak as well. Extraordinary. Never had a Sauvignon Blanc like it. Uh, it's available from Wine Society in the UK. The link will be in the chat. Okay, to the map again. We just want a quick look here. Um, look to the wild west, to the far west, you should see an olive green color, Montravel. I always want to say Montravel, but it's Montravel. And this is where you're bordering Bordeaux. So you're again, you're, you're literally here, you're bordering uh, Cote de Castillon. Um, okay, sort of uh, not too far from, uh, from Saint-Emilion. The reason I mention it is because it's part of the kind of conundrum that is Bergerac. The wines here are often really lovely, some very good producers. The terroir is very different. It's a much lighter soil, slightly higher aspect. You have these terraces above the Dordogne there. You have these lighter soils, beautiful, light, elegant wines. The typical Bergerac red wine can be a bit rustic still, although some very good winemaking is going on. And you kind of think in Montrevel, you know, they've got far more in common with their neighbours in Castillon really than they have in Bergerac, but yet they're in the Bergerac appellation. That's maybe good news for Bergerac, but if you're a producer in Montrevel and you're looking across to the next vineyard where they're selling their wines for two or three times, the, maybe not three times, possibly twice the price, of the wines that they can make because they are under the Bergerac umbrella and Bergerac does not command the prices of Bordeaux. And the next slide, I just wanted to show you this because this guy called Frank, <laughs> hi Frank, um, he makes a lovely medium sweet wine from a tiny appellation called Rosette, um, again, which is historically quite popular. They like it with an aperitif uh, in, in this part of the world bit of foie gras, of course, but you can also have it with a bit of blue cheese. But the main reason for showing that is, in case you've forgotten, that is called a handshake. You know, when you meet someone, uh, remember those days, and we used to touch them and shake hands with them. It just, I just feel happy thinking about that handshake. Next slide, please, Julia. Okay, here we are, long last, Montbaziac. I think if there's any part of Bergerac that's world famous, it is Montbaziac. I mean, the chateau there is a lovely Renaissance. Uh, chateau uh, built, built in 1550. But the area is best known for its sweet wines, okay? 
uh, and when I say sweet, I mean they are very sweet dessert wines, or as the French call them, I love this word, liqueur, liqueur for dessert wines. That means they have, and they generally, they, they generally have about 100, and, on average, around 100, 150 grams per litre of residual sugar. That's a lot of sugar, okay. Um, and as I said, the Dutch, as I mentioned earlier, really got this going in the sort of 15th, 16th century, created that export trade that still exists to Holland, the Low Countries. It's the Semillon grape variety, the white variety with its thin skin that makes it susceptible to this incredible natural phenomenon called noble rot, okay? And it's Montbazillac wines, which are very similar, everyone's thinking, is it like Sautern that you get in Bordeaux? I'd say the top Montbazillac wine is as absolutely as good as a Sautern. And there's one producer called uh, uh, Chateau Tiercourt La Graviere. Um, and I think they're Italian run as well. Golly, what is it with the Italians in, in Bergerac? Just delicious, unbelievable liquor wines that as good as any Sauternes, but again, half the price. But um, let's have a look a little bit at the Noble Rot because it, it is interesting. I love this slide. Les and I were at Montbaziac where they make um, some of the wines, you know, they've got vineyards around the chateau itself, as well as having this carved cooperative down the road where a lot of the Montbaziac wine is made. Look at that bunch of grapes. And I think the lady holding that bunch of grapes that Liz photographed, I think it's fair to say is not a, a grape picker. I gather she has very refined hands and lovely nails. <laughs> but look at the bunch of grapes. The top ones are all dark and they are fully rotten, okay? And then I'll explain why that happens in a sec. The ones below that are white, gray white. They've got the right amount of noble rot on them, okay? And at the very bottom, you've got some unaffected grapes that haven't got the rot at all. So this noble rot thing, it basically happens in autumn. It's a remarkable thing. In the autumn, and the autumns here are very long, okay? It can be warm right through till middle of November. And so it's a long growing season. And what happens is if your vineyards are near to water, and this happens in other wine regions of the world, um, what happens is, is that the air temperature, because it's autumn, starts to cool down more quickly than the river water. Or the there's a particular tributary of the uh, Dordogne called the Gardonnette, uh, and the vineyards close to here. You've got this cool air from the autumn mornings uh, relative to the relatively warm water that's been warmed up all summer, and that creates a local mist that forms in the morning. And it's that humid mist that causes the rot, botrytis, to form, botrytis scenario, to form on the skins, particularly of the semion grapes, which are particularly susceptible because the skins of them are so thin. So the fungus starts to infestate the grapes. You're thinking, oh dear, good night Vienna for the grapes, except what happens, not always, but by lunchtime, the sun comes out, burns the mist away and, and prevents really literally the total rot setting in. If the rot had set in totally, then you'd get the black, very dark grapes that you see at the top of that bunch, and you just have to chuck them out unusable. If you get partially infest, infested uh, noble rot grapes from a morning fog, that's when you get the little bit, the white bit. And, what and those are the grapes that you want to pick, the pickers have to pick. And it's so hit and miss as to when you're gonna get these conditions that you have to hand pick you can't machine harvest these grapes, and the, the Appalachian rules are, since 93, hand-picking only for Montbaziac. And so by hand-picking these grapes, these grapes, the fungus has had enough effect to puncture the skins of the grapes to get, to get the water out of the grapes, but not to ruin the grapes. So by the water um, dehydrating as a result of the fungus, you get an amazing concentration of flavours like peach and apricot and dried fruits and Wow, they can be seriously good, seriously sweet. If they were vinified dry, they'd be 17, 18%. But uh, because you want to have the residual sugar, you can calculate that, you'll probably get 12, 13%, something like that. And the rest, of course, is residual sugar, which is the style of the wine. Really amazing. Okay, let's move on. 
Okay, very quickly, last couple of slides. Have to mention this talking of natural phenomena. <laughs> Caro Feely, Caro, if you're listening, good evening. Caro Feely is a, is a bit of a phenomenon. She um, is a South African uh, lady. She and her husband, Sean, um, so both South Africans, love their wine. Uh, they had big cheese jobs in Europe. I think they were, they were in um, Ireland for a while and certainly in Dublin, but their passion was wine. And about 15 years ago, they wanted to live the dream and they bought a wreck <laughs> of a um, vineyard uh, in an area called Sosignac, which is another sweet wine area, mainly, not far uh, southwest uh, of the region of the Beaujolais. They did it up and they've created this magnificent chateau, which is now called Chateau Fili. It was previously called Augarig. It's now called Chateau Fili. They make terrific wines. They are biodynamic. They're not just organic, they're biodynamic. So I was about to say, I know, don't know much about biodynamic viticulture, which is in a way just as well, A, because we're getting short of time, and B, because Julia, Julia here, who's moving on the slides and helping me tonight, is doing a webinar next week on biodynamics. Hooray! So Julia can, uh, can deal with it all next week. Suffice to say, and I'm not taking the mickey, um, biodynamics is a serious business, whether you believe in it or not. And, um, and even Luke de Conti, the guy I showed you earlier, he has some parcels of his vineyard that are biodynamic, even though generally he's organic. And Caro, Feely, uh, Caro and Sean Feely, their wines, absolutely biodynamic. So we're talking no spraying at all. Um, we're talking animal manure, a watered down animal, a animal manure to, to water the vines. We're talking about burying cow horns in the ground. We're talking about lunar cycles. We're talking about Rudolf Steiner. Wow, it's another world. And that's all I'm gonna say on it because Julia's gonna tell us more next week. But the other thing I'd say about Caro Feely, is her story really is extraordinary. Um, oh, one other thing to say, this is quite amusing. That although Carol and Sean, the, um, Caro and Sean are biodynamic, their neighboring vineyard is run by a guy called Nick, who is totally the opposite. He sprays everything and they get on really well with him because they all get on with each other, these winemakers, even though technically they're in competition with each other, they, whenever there's a problem, they help each other out and Nick, I don't know if he's still there, but was Carol, maybe still is Caro and Sean's neighbor, who sprays everything, pesticides, you name it. And they call him Napalm Nick. <laughs> I just love the fact you've got Napalm Nick bordering biodynamic Chateau Fili. But anyway, if you want to find out more, another link going on the chat, you have to read Caro's books. I've only read the first book, she's written three or four. And the first one, which really just documents the amazing story and what they've done, living the dream is called, and I smile every time I hear its title, it's called Grape Expectations. Um, I just love the name of that book, it makes me smile. And Liz and Topper and I, we spent a couple, couple of times we over with um, Karen and Sean. She's terrific, very personable. And my golly, because of her background in marketing, which is something the French are really, I have to say, sorry, I know we've got French listeners tonight. In, in a good way, the French are not great at marketing. Um, they're great at producing, but they're not always great at understanding consumer demands and what customers want and that sort of thing. I hope I'm not causing offence there. It's just not natural. It doesn't come so naturally to the French, certainly not as much as it does to the British and to the Europeans. If you look at the way Chateau Filia marketing themselves, you can check out chateaufilia.com, read Carrie's books. Extraordinary what they're doing. Uh, you can buy a valent you know, Valentine's Day is coming up. You can buy, you can get a Valentine's pack from Chateau Fili, complete with aphrodisiacs. My God, mind boggles, as well as some wine. Um, anyway, do read her book. She also does wine tourism for visiting the area, and I do urge people to visit the area. They do amazing wine tours, both of the both of the Bergerac Croix and of the nearby Bordeaux wine region. They have a cottage there you can stay. And Caro is a WSET educator as well to boot, she's quite lady. Um, almost finishing, let's go from Caro to Carol. Just wanted to mention, give a little hi to Carol, uh, who is a lovely lady who is the owner uh, of a lovely boutique in the Beaumont, the, 
wine boutique in Beaumont du Perigord, small town where Liz and, I, and Topper and I were staying. And uh, she gave us great education about the wines of, of Bergerac. Um, but I also wanted to put this slide up because it's not, I realize it's not until you live in a wine region when you realize how distorting your view can be of the wine world. Because when you live, even if it's only for a year in Bergerac, you kind of assume, <laughs> you soon realize that Bergerac wine is, as you would expect, because it's such a huge part of their culture and their agriculture, is the center of the universe, okay? Um, but what does it mean if you go into a wine shop and you want to try some other wines? Maybe, golly, even from outside France, heaven forbid. Well, when Liz and I were there, Car uh, Carole did stock a couple, I think I picked up a Chilean Cab Sauve once, but it was quite hard, but generally French wines. Um, contacted her recently and she sent me an email and told me about the range of wines that are in her cave in Beaumont du Perigord. This is how they proportion out. 50%, half her wines are from the Bergerac Croix. Okay, no surprise there. 20% from the Rhone Valley. 10% from the Languedoc. 10% from other parts of Southwest France, i.e. Caol, Gaillac, Fronton, Madiron, Côte de Gascon, Jurançon, those ones I mentioned earlier. 5% other France, you know, just tiny little areas like Burgundy, hello, Alsace and Loire Valley, um, and just 5% from an area called Bordeaux, which I think is kind of uh, interesting. And what I do also know, well, I'd love to be proved wrong if anyone's on the line, on the, call, on the webinar from Bordeaux tonight. I'd love to know if you can go into a Bordeaux restaurant or wine shop and find Bergerac wine, because I just bet you can't. I bet you can't. It's, it's uh, such an odd thing. There you go. Living so close to it, once being part of it, but now being separate to it, and yet two are so close, but it's almost never the twain. Though I have to say, it did taste a bit of Bordeaux wine, of course, when we were there. And if you want, you get a bit sick of rural living in soggy puddles in the Perigord in the winter, you go to Bordeaux and you have a fabulous time. Of course you do. Final slide is this lovely purple vine leaf. And this, again, is why the office, the tourism in uh, Bergerac call it the purple Perigord. Le Perigord pourpre. It's because this lovely colour that the vine leaf can go in autumn, and that's that's what it's all about. So we're coming to the end of this presentation. So just a very quick summary. Bergerac, or the Perigord, historic distinctive wine region, confusing set of appellations, not well known. Historically fairly rustic wines, not always of brilliant quality, but recently, some some terrific winemaking going on that has been recognized but it's still under the radar and it's because of course on the one hand it's almost part of Bordeaux but it's not uh, and on the other hand it's in this big great big bag called southwest France. Most of the wine is said is drunk in the region or it's it's it goes via major distribution outlets to French supermarkets there's a thing called uh, Alliance Aquitaine that gets most of the wine, particularly from the uh, co-ops, um, that goes into the French supermarket system. As I mentioned earlier, 10% of Bergerac is exported. You can find it in the UK through Wine Society, through Tanner's Wines, uh, through H2 Vin in London, that's more for trade, um, but you can get some there. You'll have to Google around and find it, but again, it's knowing, like any wine region, um, if you know your producers, and there's some really, really excellent producers in Bergerac, I've mentioned a couple of them tonight, you can have a, you can have a really, really wonderful wine experience that will not be expensive, which I think is important to say, particularly in these times at the moment. So I think it's time to have a pause. I might have a slightest sip of a Bergerac Blanc Sec. And um, maybe we'll have some questions. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Richard. That has been excellent. Um, 
so much appreciation coming in for you at the chat currently that I can't even read it quick enough. Um, <laughs> so lots of people here saying thank you and how much they've enjoyed it and how informative it's been. Um, if you are up for a few questions, we have had a few come in. Um, <laughs> the volume seems to have increased quite a lot in the last few minutes. So um, I'm not sure we'll have time to get through all of them. Um, some are a bit more specific and some are a little bit more general. Um, but let's let's have a go for a few minutes if you're up for that. Um, and then if anyone has any questions uh, that don't get answered, they can always get in touch with us at uh, schooleducators at wsctglobal.com and we can Absolutely. I'm very, very happy to, to do some written answers to any people if you don't get to, no problem. Oh, that's very much appreciated. Um, all right, you ready to go? Yeah. Let's, um, I'll try, I'm not sure how many of these we'll get through. We'll start with um, a more general one. Uh, you obviously mentioned a couple of producers as part of the presentation, um, but Giorgio wants to know if there are any, uh, well, he's asked for three interesting Bergerac producers that must be known or tried. Yeah. Uh, my favorite producer, I didn't actually mention, which is a bit naughty of me, but you know, I'm, there's only so much time. Um, I would mention the Vigno Vignoble de Verdo, okay? Uh, Verdo is V-E-R-D-O-T-S, Verdo. Um, and a guy, his the wine producer is a guy called David Fortu. And Verdo is one, again, I think there are four or five top producers and he's definitely one of those top ones. And the reason I love it, apart from the, his, the fact that his wines are, are beautiful, I'm actually sipping one at the moment. I'm sipping a 2018, Clos de Verdo, it's 75% Sauvignon Blanc, okay, it's 15% Semillon and it's 10% Muscadel and it's absolutely delicious. It's got the vivacity from the Sauvignon but it's also got this lovely kind of mouth feel from the Semillon and a bit of, it's slightly exotic from the Muscadel, a slight oily texture, it is absolutely divine. So Verdo is my number one favourite. Luc de Conti, as I mentioned, at Tour des Gendres, G-E-N-D-R-E-S is another. Um, they all have slightly annoying names that aren't difficult, are a bit tricky to scribble down, but uh, Ancien Cure uh, is another one, a guy called Christian Roche, who's a, who's a, a genius producer. And Caro Feely, Chateau Feely, very good producer, biodynamic. There you go, there are four. Excellent. Um, a slight alternative uh, perspective here. Um, Hans has uh, made the comment that um, he thinks that some of the winemakers maybe don't make enough of the difference between Bergerac and Bordeaux. Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, um, I don't. I, 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 I think I might ask that question slightly differently. I think I think the pro I don't think it's much the producer's problem. I mean, in some senses, the producer's hands are slightly tied, aren't they? If they're under the appellation system, and it's a Bergerac appellation system. I think the question is broader. If you are head of wine, wouldn't that be a great job? Head of wine in Bergerac. I want that job. Um, and I know we're talking about rewriting culture and history in a country like France, which you just can't do very easily. But if you were setting out now, would you seriously create 13 appellations within Bergerac and give them all different names and some slightly different and overlapping kind of names and terminologies? It wouldn't make sense. I think, you know, I'm not a marketing expert, but I know a lot of people out listening tonight are. I think Bergerac needs rebranding, actually. Um, and so that Bergerac name needs defining. And what is that story? Because Bergerac does have a great story, but it's so fragmented through these sort of diverse appellations. I mean, let's face it, wine as a category is fragmented, isn't it? So how many wines are there? And it's so difficult. Uh, customers or potential customers to get their heads around it. I think that's where it needs to come from. It needs to come from the top. Yeah, that seems like a very reasonable assessment. Um, change is uh, not that frequent in some of these <laughs> rules, though, is it? So uh, We're talking about France and why. And, you know, my favourite country in the world. I'm not being disparaging. But, you know, these matters are deeply entrenched and France is a deeply conservative, I mean that with a small, you know, it's a very conservative, you know, culturally, historically, 
convention is massively important in France, more so than, than Britain, I think. So to change these things, I think it's really difficult. Yeah, um, well, time will tell. Things do change. Um, mm. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I'm not saying they can't change, but it might take a while. It'd be interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, I might skip over a few of the quite specific vine training questions. Um, you can get in touch with us if you want to know more on that. Um, a question here about co-ops. How important are co-ops in the region? Well, funny enough, <clears throat> There are only four. <clears throat> there are only four co-ops in the region. One of them is is a Mombasiak co-op, which is the most, if you like, prestigious co-op because, as I mentioned, you know, mentioned um, Mombasiak is quite hard to produce with the noble rot. So they have a really terrific co-op that has about eighty to one hundred members, and of course it depends on the conditions. You don't get the rotten grapes every time, every year. Blah blah blah. There are three other cooperatives and they are important and they are they're doing a lot of, as I mentioned, a lot of the vinification for people who are producers who are great at producing grapes but don't have the facilities to produce the wine. So cooperatives are important. Um, but rather than being loads of small cooperatives, they tend to be three larger ones in, in Bergerac. And again, it's that line, I suppose, from wine made in cooperatives that is a key in the market, particularly in terms of the French supermarket market, if you sort of mean. And, and also you do get a little bit making its way into supermarkets and deep discounters over here. Little, little occasionally do a Bergerac. Even Sainsbury's do one. Often I have to say the labels are a little bit misleading. As my friend and I found out recently, it was clearly a wine made in a cooperative that a negotiant had got hold of and blended some wine, stuck a label on it, called it the Duke de Castillac, <laughs> made up some historical story about Bergerac. And um, and stuck it on a wine level, so you do get a bit of that at the lower end of the spectrum. But yes, co-ops are important. Yeah, definitely. But to be honest, the real heart of the interest of Bergerac has to be the individual producers, and they're not exclusive. They're not expensive, and there are three hundred odd of them, so they're very accessible. The the independents are very accessible. Good stuff. Um, topical question here is climate change. Um, a challenge to the producers or an opportunity to the producers in uh, Bergerac? Yeah, I think that's, <clears throat> I think it's both actually, um, because the, I alluded it to a bit in the talk, the, the, the trend when we're talking to producers and our friends who live out there, the trend now is for much wetter springs followed by hotter summers, okay. So you're getting a different type of, clearly it's warming up and there's plenty of evidence for that these past 20 years. Um, I still think it's okay because I think with the intensity of the weather, <laughs> including the rain, I think generally speaking, vine stress is largely not an issue at the moment here in, in Bergerac. Obviously in a really exceptional year it can be, and we've had some hot summers recently and obviously back in 03, um, that was a tricky one because of the intensity of it. I think there's enough water around for it to be okay. But I've certainly got to keep their, keep their eye on it. And of course, down the road in Bordeaux, they've just announced some new varieties, haven't they? Like um, Jeriga Nacional from Portugal that's coming in into Bordeaux as a, as a secondary uh, variety. So clearly moves up our foot. Maybe that will come to Bergerac too. Yeah, that was... Um quite interesting news wasn't it talking about not yeah. many changes happening there, there you go, go. Huge variety in Bordeaux so yes change can happen in southwest France there we go we have proof of it with that announcement last week um I think a, a little two-parter here maybe uh, first off um what is your preferred uh, local food and wine match yeah I'm sorry I didn't talk a bit more about food but it's uh, because it's so much at the, at the heart of it. But uh, I'll, <clears throat> <there's, clears throat> I'll just give you one terrific example of this, actually. Um, I mentioned they love duck um, in, uh, in the region. If you can buy confit, confit, you buy it in a tin, it's duck that's already been cooked in its own juices and then preserved in a tin. You buy it for about 12 euros a tin. You then undo the tin and it slithers out looking like cat food and quite appalling <laughs> into a saucepan. You slowly 
eat it very, very slowly for about 20 minutes. I did this with my friend, Mike. Hi, Mike, I'm sure you're listening. Um, and you then make some pom salades, which are like sauteed potatoes that you add a bit of garlic to. You then open a bottle of Cote de Bergerac Rouge, which is a, you know, <clears throat> the better quality, an oak aged Bergerac. Maybe La Gloire de Montpère would be a good one. And it is honestly sensational. I'm not exaggerating, so I think it's one of the best food and wine moments of my life was when we had what looked like tin cat food heated up with the delicious garlicky potatoes accompanied by a very well-made Cote de Bergerac rouge. I th honestly, it's just heavenly, really, really heavenly. With the Montbaziac, important thing to mention, they pair it with foie gras as an aperitif, and foie gras as an aperitif, often with a glass of Montbaziac. If you don't like foie gras, and as you gathered, I don't, it pairs brilliantly with blue cheese, and you can get some very good local blue cheeses. Um, with that sweetness um, and the acidity in that um, Montbaziac wine and blue cheese, fantastic. Well, that's made my stomach rumble. Yeah, I'm getting hungry Even now. with the uh, cat food <laughs> comparison. <laughs> Um, there's another question here. I'll, I'll just keep another couple, I think. Um, Nina says, uh, in Bordeaux, you've seen a difference in quality levels for the Bergerac. As in Bordeaux, have you seen a difference in quality levels for the Bergerac region with the new generation? Big investment definitely. to make these changes, but have you seen a movement? Definitely, definitely, definitely. And again, that movement, <clears throat> that movement has only really been happening um, for the past um, 30 years or so, the likes of Luc de Conti and the guy I mentioned, David Fortou at Verdot, uh, Caro Fili with Biodynamics, uh, Christian Roche, um, they are making such beautiful, beautiful wines and they are absolutely raising the bar in Bergerac. And again, just the, generally speaking, what's going on everywhere, this is what amazes me, even in my uh, life of wine, which isn't, you know, seriously uh, that long in terms of when I've been really deeply interested in it, how good the quality of even quite entry-level wines are. And it's because people are so much better with stainless steel temperature control in the winery and the viticulture practice is so much better. You know, 10, 20 years ago, it was all about magicians in the winery. And it's much more now about experts in viticulture who can just ripen their grapes perfectly. They know how much to shield their grapes if, you know, if it's going to be too hot or, you know, or where they're planting them or, you know, how they can protect their vines from, from bad weather and that sort of thing. And picking times, knowing the right time to pick, not leaving fruit to hang sometimes so it gets so, so cooked. And then you get these really cooked, stewy red wines that you would have got 30 years ago that are really highly alcoholic which was the style that people wanted because Robert Parker, let's face it, was driving that style of wine 30 years ago. Now people want less and the less is more philosophy is really strong across the wine world, I think, especially in France and, and in Bergerac. We mustn't just see Bergerac as some little backwater. There's some really, yes, it's under the radar, but it's a lot of quality wine going on. And this new generation and the guys that I've mentioned and Caro Feely, the likes of these people, are driving that forward at the moment. Lovely. Um, and sort of sticking with the sort of winemaking theme, um, someone uh, is asking, do we see some clay fermentation vessels in the Luc de Conti photo? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think yeah, someone else has asked a similar question about um, experimentation with different uh, things as well. So, yeah. Absolutely. And that's an example of it because Luc de Conti, I mean, he's getting on a bit now, but his son and his family are all involved in uh, Chateau Tour des Gendres. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he is, he, he is an experimenter, as you gathered by that Sauvignon blog that I described. Um, he loves his amphorae. But what does Luc de Conti do? He'll go to, he'll, you know, A, he'll go to China and try and sell his wines. B, he'll travel to Georgia I don't mean Atlanta, Georgia. Sorry, Atlanta, Georgia, if you're on the line. <laughs> He'll go to Georgia, former Soviet Union, and look at how they do winemaking there. And he's big into amphorae. He, he thinks that adds real texture to the wine and gives it this lovely calm stability whilst it's uh, 
in its post-fermentation stage um, before it goes into the bottle. So yeah, I mean, he really, he's not just a winemaker, that guy, Luke, uh, is more of an alchemist. What he does with some of his wines are, are really fantastic. He also makes a pet nat sparkling wine, absolutely revolting. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there you go. Can't, can't win them all the time, I guess. I'm sure some people love it. Yeah. Um, that takes us to our sort of quarter past mark now. So I think it's probably time to call it a day, even though 